everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we bring you a gameplay of Madara. Now I've done one before, that was early on, and I believe that was even in the introduction scenarios. This time I'm going to show you a boss fight. So I don't know when or where a boss is showing up, but I, uh, I did a little research ahead of time, I got myself some slight spoilers to find the uh, scenario with a good boss fight to show. I've heard this boss fight is pretty good. This is about uh, 12 or so encounters into the game. And uh, the, the backstory here is basically the, the adventurers were going down into this vault in order to basically find whatever cool stuff is down in there. And the last time they were in this vault, they got their asses handed to them, ended up getting sent up, you know, like retreated out of there and some crazy stuff happened to a couple of them and and so now they've kind of regrouped, uh, they've, they've learned some new disciplines, gotten some new equipment, and they're heading back down in there uh, to try and do it again, try to get in there and actually manage to uh, find whatever is in the, in the uh, vault down here. So we are going to get right down here to the scenario. This is gonna be the setup video and then we'll bring you a gameplay video here in the next few days. Also, of course, be sure to go check out these t-shirts and other great t-shirts over at Mr. Meeple. The link is in the description below and there's a 15% off coupon code in the description as well. So be sure to check that out. Also, of course, I wanna mention our sponsor, Board Game Co. This is a, a website where you can go, you can find hard to find games. You can find games for great prices. They let you buy games, sell games, and trade games, which is a little bit unusual, which is a great way to you know build your collection and purge your collection at the same time. You've got some games you don't want anymore. Well, hey, somebody else probably does. Go over there, you can trade games, get something for the one you're turning in. Uh, at Board Game Co., they will let you buy, sell, and trade your way into a better collection. All right, so here we go. We're getting the board set up here for Finding Their Way, which is uh, an encounter, about, about close to a dozen encounters into uh, Madara, the, the Unintentional Malum Act 1. So with this one, we've obviously got our adventure starting down here. And then the initially we'll have these three cave circles and then one animate up here. Uh, let's see. It looks like right now we're probably trying to head over into this direction some, somehow. You can see there's a totem here, uh, but all of this is obstructing terrain. So the totem, you know, can't see it this way. So I have to come up here and around to see that one. Another blue totem up here and there's an objective here. That objective gets triggered. Uh, it, well, it, it represents a large set of locked double doors is what the scenario says. When the warden is defeated, reread the following text, but I don't even know what the warden is yet. So I'm guessing it's probably something triggered by one of those two totems, maybe the blue totem. Uh, also, we've got a treasure chest up here, which is a random treasure chest. Don't know, there, there's four possible colors, blue, red, green, and yellow. Not sure which one that is. We'll figure that out when we flip it over. And that's pretty much where we're at. There is a possible achievement called Like a Blur. And uh, I'll get that achievement if one of my characters manages to dodge five different attacks in a single round. So that's something we're gonna have to be keeping track of. Hopefully I can get that. I've managed to get the last couple of achievements that were possible. So hopefully we can keep that streak going. Uh, and the only win condition is an adventurer finds and ends their turn on the blue exit. But as you can see, there is no blue exit yet. So obviously pro either uh, new tokens are gonna be put out or more likely I would think is that one, maybe that objective or something like that will trigger an expansion to the board and then we'll find the blue exit eventually that way. I'm not gonna run through all the specifics regarding what these uh, the cave stick on the animate do in terms of their actions and, and their, their AI steps and everything. Uh, you'll kind of obviously see that as we start the game. Uh, I will go and show you their stats down here. You can see he's got a decent conviction. Uh, it's purple is obviously the lowest and then white and then orange. So he's uh, pretty high up there for his conviction checks. Uh, pretty good casting die too. And then he can increase his physical damage uh, with those symbols. Uh, 18 health, which is a pain since he also has this two armor that can absorb damage, and then a decent defense, and he moves six, which is pretty standard. 
uh, and he has these two passive abilities, Chains of Perdition. Uh, the first time each turn the animate hits with an attack, he has a follow-up, make another attack with the same range and damage type against the same target. And then Heavy Cleave, the first time each turn the animate makes an attack against an adjacent opponent, it will empower the attack. And then with the Cave Sickles, obviously there's three of them on the board, which means that each one has two within Sphere of Influence, which is six spaces away. So they'll be using these dice for their attack. Uh, and as, you know, that's the base die there. And then if it was just one within Sphere of Influence and then two, fortunately it's not three because then they start adding defense as well, which is a huge pain. They're also immune to poison. And uh, let's see, yeah. So they can increase their physical damage and they have the baseline conviction with two purple dice. All right, so we're gonna run through each of our adventures real quick since we have a lot going on here with them. So first we've got Zeke, who is this many right here. All right, and he is my guy that is set up for constant counters, basically. Uh, probably to the point where I need to, it might be a little bit overkill, we'll probably start swapping some of those out as we get access to some different um, items and everything. He's got two different swords here, the Sword of Dominions, which is actually a unique mundane weapon. Um, I'll be using this orange die instead of the white die because it has finesse or com uh, finesse is triggered when it's comboed with another sword, which obviously the Espelancer is. Uh, it's got the reinforced weapon upgrade and um, it can let him move diagonally by exhausting it. And this has this passive ability. Whenever I defeat an opponent during my turn, an ally within Sphere of Influence heals three. All right, and then the Espelancer here is uh, a white die for the attack. It is, has a passive ability that if I don't have a heavy tag, which I don't have a heavy tag anywhere, then the weapon gains plus one armor. And if I don't have a heavy tag, I also ignore negative effects from movement from terrain. That one I forget a lot. I got, hopefully I won't forget during this, but um, negative, negative effects from terrain won't affect me for movement purposes. And then let's see, I can exhaust it to counter even if the attack that I'm countering damaged me. Then we've got Too Many Belts, which is an accessory. Uh, it absorbs the first two physical damage that I take uh, from an attack each turn, and I can exhaust it for dodge. I've got Sickle Venom. Once per encounter, I can inflict poison. This mundane relic here, which is the Enchanted Piercings, I've already flipped it over in a previous part of this encounter that you know, I haven't been able to restore, so I can't flip it back yet. Uh, the flipping allowed me to make a reroll but right now all it's doing for me is increasing my conviction, a conviction upgrade to a white die. Then the fate engine here, also conviction upgrade to a white die. So instead of two purples, I have to uh, do two white dice. And once per encounter after a roll is made against you, remove all symbols from one die. All right, the occult shirt. Now I know that the, a lot of the cloth armor has been adjusted in the 1.1 version of the game. I'm still running 1.0 rules here, so the you know, 1.1 is obviously what's in Kickstarter right now, and uh, eventually I'm gonna uh, update everything, but we're doing 1.1, so uh, it, it, it might change a few things, but basically they, they kind of nerfed the cloth armor a little bit because it's maybe a little bit too far powerful with this ability down here, which is if the attack deals no damage, I can, well, first I exhaust it to dodge, and then if the attack deals no damage, unexhaust it to then counter. And it has this masterwork upgrade attached to it as well. Got my tally juice box for some healing, got some throwing knives for some uh, nice little uh, unblockable damage and smoke bomb to prevent break attacks and the ability core, which allows me to counter and provides one extra defense. My disciplines here, we've got fortuitous homicide, basically just lets me counter. And then we've got magic breaker, which is pretty cool. Uh, it is obviously my level two. Make an attack when determining damage, roll the opponent's best casting die and add the number rolled to, as physical damage. So that's pretty cool, kind of use their magic abilities against them. All right, now we've got Remy, who of course is the mini with the giant wings that doesn't fit into a single space anywhere. But that's all right because she looks so badass. So, uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, Zeke has a passive ability that's just part of his character where he can reroll a dodge once per round or once per turn. Okay, so Remy Moretti, 
She can fly for, instead of just walking, she can fly for two, um, two stamina points. Uh, she's got the cloak, which has a passive ability that when making a conviction check, well, it basically just ups her conviction a little bit, and you can exhaust it to die. She has a longbow, which if she stands still is a little bit more powerful. Uh, has a range of six. It is a two-handed weapon. Purple white is what you roll, and it can increase physical damage in a couple different ways. And she has a follow-up ability to move one space after using it. Uh, and it's got this venomous upgrade to it, which allows me to uh, potentially inflict poison on enemies. We've got uh, the Doom Break here, which is my first common item that I found. Uh, everything else here pretty much is mundane, I believe. And this, she can exhaust to gain one stamina point. I also have to then roll the black die. And if I end up getting a, a skull, then I flip it over and it's pretty much done until they get restored. Uh, the quiver, which basically lets these three arrows don't count towards my consumables. And as you can see, she doesn't have any other consumables. She's used them all, so that's kind of where she's at right now. Um, and then we've got... And actually, you know what, what I'm going to do? In between the encounters... I think in between encounters, you can rearrange items and everything. So I'm going to pull these two Vitality Juice boxes that are in Zeke's pack and give them to her. I'll do that after, after we finish this up. Uh, so anyway, so that's the quiver just handles those arrows. And then right here we have another one of the enchanted piercings that's been flipped. So right now all it's doing is upgrading her conviction die. The Curus over here, I can exhaust it to uh, reduce physical damage by two. And it provides one armor and it has this masterwork attached to it, masterwork upgrade. This defensive core has a masterwork upgrade attached to it, exhausted for dodge. It gives her two health and gives her one extra defense. I love that thing. She has these three arrows. These two arrows have already been flipped. Those are magic arrows. If I use them one more time, then they'll be gone. The barbed arrow still has two charges on it. Uh, let's see here. The familiar is her level one right here. And basically that allowed me to have this familiar follow her around. Uh, the Tristram Spirit, which removes an effect, but right now that's already been flipped and used. So right now it's giving plus two physical damage is the only thing it's doing, but it's still pretty good. And then this is, uh, I've got these two things here just ready to remind me that I can still use it. Those I'll use as um, uh, summon tokens. And when I flip it, I get the two summon tokens and I can summon an Esper. Uh, to help out and I probably will be doing that since we're gonna be facing a boss here in this in this uh, encounter Okay, so now where are we at? All right, so we've got Nightingale who is my primary uh, caster my primary spell user Still need to buff her up a little bit But I this organic liquefy pretty heavy with and this spell right here has have both this has really come in handy from a, from a more support standpoint. So let's look at these real quick. So we've got Crumbling Time. Exhaust, cast spell six, your target is inflicted with Wilt. And what is Wilt? It is passive, cool, there we go. When determining damage, roll the black die for each um, shield rolled, add plus one irreducible damage. So that can really be helpful and really make a difference uh, sometimes with some of the tougher enemies. Well, really with any of them though. And then organic liquefy, let's look at that. That is, it costs, you can see three stamina points. It's very expensive. Cast a spell six, deal magic damage equal to the number rolled using the target's two best conviction dice. So got one guy, uh, Zeke over there, who's turning the, uh, the monsters casting dice against them, and then Nightingale over here is turning their conviction dice against them. And then we've got the magic staff here. It has a number of things going on. So uh, if she uses it as a melee weapon, it's two purple dice, but it's, it's passive. It increases her casting die. When determining the force of a spell, tokens on this card may be spent to add plus one to your roll. And how do you get tokens? Well, you can exhaust it when you fail to affect a target with a spell, add one stamina point as an ability token to this card. It can only have one at a time. So only ever gonna have one token, but that one token can increase the, uh, the roll, the force of a spell by one. I can also exhaust it to cast a spell to try to deal some damage, some magic damage 
Also, when it's used as a melee attack, uh, it can deal two magic damage for every two of those rolled as well. And it has this masterwork upgrade. Got the cloak, which we talked about with Remy just a second ago. Wand of Missiles. This increases my sphere of influence by two, so that can be useful sometimes. The badass leather jacket is uh, plus two health. I can exhaust it to make a dodge, uh, or when making dodge, I can reroll the dodge. And then it has the passive ability of reducing damage dealt to me by uh, two from melee attacks. And it has this reinforced armor upgrade. The defensive core, which we covered before, uh, is reinforced as well. And we have the magic bomb, which allows me to remove an effect from an ally within sphere of influence. All right, and finally we've got Rook, who, uh, oh, by the way, Nightingale's uh, ability that's just part of her character is that she can, and she, she can gain two stamina points once per encounter, and all of her other allies can gain one stamina point. So now with Rook, his ability is just that he has extra health. He starts with 14 instead of 12 like everybody else. The uh, weapons we've got, we've got this shield, which has been flipped. Um, and so it lost this ability to basically throw out some dangerous terrain. So other than that, uh, we, it has a white die, but it is comboed with a melee weapon. So it uses an orange die instead. And then I can exhaust it to counter. And it, it does have this masterwork upgrade attached to it. And this masterwork upgrade is attached to the hand axe which uh, basically if I miss an attack, I can exhaust it to attack again. White die for the attack and I can increase physical damage with the symbols. Got a smoke bomb and then this hyper energy HP potion. Sorry about that glare there. Uh, this allows me to heal three and gain one stamina point. The Curus, uh, which we've talked about before with, and it's got the venomous upgrade. Fight drive gives me one extra attack, uh, once per encounter that is. The sickle, uh, sickle Shell Charm makes me immune to poison, which is always good when we're dealing with Cave Sickles. And the Chip Chitten, I can flip it uh, when I'm dealt damage and I can ignore all physical damage dealt to me. Too Many Belts, which we talked about earlier, and the Deflection Core, which upgrades my Conviction Die to a White Die, and I can flip it to automatically pass a Conviction Check, and it gives me one additional uh, defense as well. And then the Venomous Core upgrade as well for this core. Now his two abilities, First, we've got Living Bulwark. Once per encounter, when you're dealt damage from an attack, ignore all physical damage dealt to you. All right, so you can just absorb that damage. And then from the grave, once per encounter, place a defeated ally within Sphere of Influence. Then they heal equal to half their maximum health points. All right, so there you go. That's the setup for Midara with this particular scenario, getting ready for a boss fight. I'm excited. Got a lot of good stuff here. My guys are a little bit taxed from uh, getting to this point in this particular series of encounters. So a few of my items are flipped. Uh, you know, won't have uh, won't have them, but that's the way this game works. You know, you got to be careful when you use some of that stuff because you might not get to restore them. Be sure to check us back out in a couple of days when we will have a gameplay. And of course, Madara is on Kickstarter right now. Be sure to go check that out as well. They're reprinting the uh, Act 1 and they have Act 2 and 3 on Kickstarter as well. And until next time, if you're bored online, bored offline.